Hi, this is Fiona from the Indie Live podcast team. This week's podcast is an episode of the TNT show. Host John Drummond interviews MP Tommy Shepherd. Hello, my name is John Drummond and welcome to the TNT show, The Nation Talks. Let me introduce Tommy Shepherd, MP. Welcome, Tommy. How are you? Hi, John. Oh, I'm good, thank you. Yeah, it's, a, it's quite a drink day here in London at the minute when we're recording this. I'm looking out the window at grey skies, but, um, but otherwise I'm, I'm in good form. Still, you'll be home in Edinburgh soon. So. Yeah, indeed, indeed. I shall yeah. be home tonight. Talking about the Queen's speech as we were, before you give us your thoughts on that, Ian Blackford's comments yesterday during the Queen's speech. We're not seeking the Prime Minister's permission. The only permission we need, the only permission we will ever need, is the democratic permission of the Scottish people. And let's not forget that it's the people of Scotland who hold sovereignty. And you might want to listen to this, because let's not forget the legal opinion in the case of McCormick versus the Crown at the Court of Session in 1953, when Lord Cooper stated that the principle of the unlimited sovereignty of Parliament is a distinctly English principle that has no counterpart right. in Scottish constitution. Yeah. It is, Mr Speaker, unquestionably the right of those in Scotland to determine their own future. Those rights were enshrined in the claim of right that was so instrumental in delivering our devolved parliament and is the case today as we seek to exercise our rights in an independence referendum. Let me remind the words to the Prime Minister of Parnell, who used to sit on these very benches. No man has the right to fix the boundary of the march of a nation. No man has the right to say to his country, thus far shalt go and no further. Mr Speaker, time and time again, the people of Scotland have spoken, and they want a choice, the choice to choose our own future. They spoke in the last Holyrood election, and they spoke again last Thursday. And the longer that Scottish democracy speaks, the louder it will get if the Conservatives want to stand in the way. If they want to try and deny democracy, then they should well be warned. Democracy will sweep them away, just as their party was swept away last week. These are stirring, eloquent words, Tommy. Absolutely fascinating that uh, you know that Ian is is talking about sovereignty and uh, being invested in the people. I mean, it is a very different concept to that which pertains in in the UK. It is, uh, although not different from what pertains most places in the world, of course, where the the right of people who live in a particular geographic area to determine how they're governed and de- determine. What happens there in that place is is usually unchallenged, and I mean, it is bizarre how many people on the uh, the English left, for example, uh, believe in self determination for just about everybody apart from the people that live in Scotland. Um, but uh, you know, but I think we're you know, it is we, we promised that once we had COVID in the rearview mirror, and you know, once we were through this election campaign for the the councils last week that we would begin to run through the gears on the road to the referendum. And uh, what Ian said yesterday is, is the start of that. Uh, you know, uh, he said it very well, and I agree with, uh, with, with pretty much every word he said. Uh, but it is important as part of the context of what's going to happen in the rest of this year that we absolutely assert the sovereign right of the people of Scotland to determine their own future. And that, that you know, the Tories don't, will, will never agree to that. But within the rest of political opinion in Scotland, that, I think, is not such a controversial proposition. Uh, both the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats signed up to the claim of right uh, back, in, uh, you know, back at the end of the, the 20th century. So one would hope that, that we can uh, get them to a position where they endorse that again. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's some of the questions that we, we've had when we, when we said that you were, you were going to be appearing. It, it, some of the questions are about sovereignty and... and, and uh, they hinge upon the, the notion that if you accept that the Scots are sovereign, how come we left the EU? Because the sovereign wish of the Scottish people then was not to leave the EU. There's a difference between having a right and, and the state being in existence. You know, we, we are claiming the right to make our own decisions as, 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 a, you know, as, as a sovereign entity. 
uh, of five and a half million people living in the north of the, the British island, um, we, we believe we have the right to determine our own future. But that right does not yet exist in our legislative or political processes. That is exactly what we're fighting for. That is why we want to leave behind the archaic British constitution and, and set up a new constitutional framework for a, a new modern progressive Scotland. If I could try and summarise what you just said, is it, the, is it your view that there is a moral right but not a political right? No, there is a political... We have a political right, but we need to change the status quo. I mean, so, so our, we have the right to make the change. What we need to do now is to convince a majority of people to get behind that change uh, and, and to make it. Uh, and, I, you know, independence for Scotland will require... Two things. I mean, it will require the consent of the Scottish people expressed in a, a free and democratic way. Uh, and it will also uh, then require to a negotiated political settlement with the British state. Uh, uh, but we, at the minute, we're in the first of those processes. Uh, and in 2012, of course, the, 20, uh, the 2012 agreement, um, uh, the, the two were linked together in that the British government agreed that whatever the outcome of the referendum, that would lead to a, a political change. They are stalling in that, but they, they cannot uh, prevent us consulting people and gaining the consent of the Scottish people for the change in the first place. And once we do that, I think we're going to completely change the, the whole mood of this discussion. Uh, and I, despite what they say now, I think the, the Tories will have no uh, alternative but to uh, get into a room and start talking. You think so seriously? I mean, here, here, yeah, here. I do. I mean, I think, I, I think, because I think the consequences of not doing that are just uh, are are too difficult to to comprehend. And I think also they would, uh, you know, in a, in a situation where a majority of people in Scotland had voted that they wanted the Scottish government to be autonomous and and Scotland to become a new nation state with the best of relations with the the, the rest of Britain, as we've always said, uh, but to have that political power for ourselves resting in Scotland. In a situation where people had chosen to do that and the British government were then, by whatever means, trying to frustrate that will, I think we would be able to marshal international opinion. We would be able to, uh, you know, mobilise uh, a lot of international public opinion against uh, the British government. And I think they would find themselves in a very difficult position. Uh, oh, you, you say that, but a lot of people will be looking at Boris Johnson and his amoral behaviour and say, how could we possibly expect somebody of that predisposition to the, uh, his connection to the truth is, is sometimes marginal. Uh, how could yeah. you possibly expect someone like that to un even begin to understand or mm -hmm. never mind accept well, what you just uh, said? To be honest, I, I mean, I, I'm, I think it's unlikely that Boris Johnson would be on the other side of that table. Uh, I think by the time we get to that, uh, he will be part of history himself. I think one of the reasons, I mean, I mean that would be excellent if that happened, but I think one of the reasons that people feel concerned uh, about uh, having any uh, prospect of Boris Johnson having control over this process is when they look at Northern Ireland just now. Now, they look at a situation where the people there were very clear. They, they couldn't have been more abundantly plain about what they wanted. Uh, the increase in the Sinn Féin vote, coupled with the increase in the alliance support, uh, seemed to most people to be unequivocal. I mean, the, 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 a democratic vote was taken and there was a democratic result. But when one looks at the attitude of the British government to that, perversely, they seem to be saying, well, I, I know that the party that came, that used to be in power, wants uh, to abandon the protocol, uh, and therefore we're going to stick with them. And we've yeah, got the democratic output there. What's your take on that? Well, um, I mean, you know, John, I'm, I'm from Northern Ireland, so, and uh, I have a lot of family and friends there, and uh, so it, it, it's something that uh, I feel quite deeply, the situation that's happening there. And I mean, I, I myself, I'm, I'm, from a, I'm from a Protestant working class community. That's where I was born and, and, and brought up. And, and it sort of, so the tribalism that still exists in, in Northern Irish politics, I find extremely upsetting. And I, you know, I, but, but there are signs of, that that is changing. And actually the, the DUP and indeed the official Unionist parties probably now 
is uh, represents a minority of public opinion in, in the north of Ireland. They certainly represent a minority of the votes cast in the election last week and a minority of the representatives in the Northern Ireland Assembly. So I think we're getting, the British government's getting itself into very difficult water with, with, with this at the minute because it's almost getting to a point where it seems to be accepting that a, a minority of the people of Northern Ireland have the right to veto the wishes of the majority. Uh, and I mean, the, all this discussion about the, the protocol, which is sort of a proxy for a lot of other stuff as well. But I mean, but if you just take the protocol, for example, a majority of the people elected to the assembly do not want to scrap the, the, the protocol. They can see the advantages of almost getting the best of both worlds of being part of a trading relationship within the United Kingdom, but also being uh, have, having better preferential access to European markets as well. So, uh, and you'll find a lot of business leaders, for example, a lot of, of people actually, you know, engaged in the economy in Northern Ireland who are anxious to try and make the protocol work and can see the benefits of it. So this idea that it's some sort of anathema and, and is rejected by the people of Northern Ireland, which is a narrative the DUP were, 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 were saying yesterday in the House of Commons, I mean, it just doesn't hold water and the evidence isn't there for it. So... The British government, you know, I would be disappointed if they sort of effectively allow the DUP a veto on any uh, any, any progress in, in Northern Ireland. That would be contrary to the the letter and the spirit of the Good Friday Agreement. And I think that would provoke a lot of concern internationally, not least of which uh, would be in Washington, who are looking at this very closely. Yeah, I can imagine that would be the case because the Americans are heavily involved in, in a lot of these arrangements in Northern Ireland, I'm thinking about the Good Friday Agreement, but we do seem to have a, a UK government which seems to be, have set itself on a path of saying, we don't care. We don't care for public opinion. We don't care for democracy. We don't particularly care about international opinion. All of the things that you felt might precipitate a change of mood or mind uh, versus Scotland, because if you look at the case of Northern Ireland, they seem to be saying, well, we don't care for any of that stuff. It may be very ethical and moral for us to concede that, but we're not going to do it. We're just going to break this international treaty. We don't care what anyone else thinks. We don't care what Northern Ireland thinks. I mean, how does that make you feel when you look at that? Well, uh, I mean, uh, it makes me angry, but uh, I mean, also, I think, you know, it it is very much a sort of bunker mentality that they've got themselves into as well. I think, you know, that Whereas in the, even a generation ago, there were a lot of uh, people inside the Conservative Party who had a, a much better grasp of the, the multinational state that is the United Kingdom and, the, and the, the, the differences and nuances in different parts of it. Nowadays, the, you know, the, the Tories have very little conception of that. They, know, they, they have no organic relationship to Northern Ireland, obviously. But, I mean, they, their, their presence in Scotland now is, is, is almost residual. Uh, and therefore, they're, they're not invested in it in the same way that they used to be in, in decades past. And that's feeding through, I think, to the, the, the Tory party leadership in the central machinery. And it's becoming now a very, very, I mean, it's, it's almost been captured by, a, you know, by a British nationalists who uh, it's, can only see that blinkered approach and that, that, that future. And the response to that is, I think we just have to stand up to it with confidence and we have to have confidence in our own future because you know at the end of the, i think at the end of the day you know they, they, this battle is going to be won by those who have the most conviction to win it it's the people who believe in it most are going to be the ones who will triumph and we need to you know rediscover and rebuild our our self-confidence and our self-belief uh, and 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 exude that much more in the months and and years ahead I think I would agree with that. And it's interesting, a couple of weeks ago, we had uh, two experts on from Europe and Scotland, Scotland and Europe, rather, uh, uh, who joined us from Oxford. And they made it very plain that one of the concerns they have was the lack of assertiveness in, in Scottish public opinion about the worth of Scotland, about the contribution that Scots make and what they could bring to the international arena. And they wanted Scots to be much more on the front foot uh, so they're very much echoing what you've just said. Uh, well, well I, I, I mean, and of course they are. It's just we don't shout about it very much, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's also interesting, by the way, that uh, the person I heard use uh, the interesting uh, statement: uh, the Conservative Party is the English Nationalist Party. Was actually from the DUP. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what motivated him to 
to come to that sort of uh, uh, understanding, which is probably more obvious to the rest of us, I would imagine. Uh, sticking with this, this the uh, the state opening I, I, again, the Queen's speech. Mm. What, what did you make of all the flummery and the uh, traipsing back and forth and people in fancy yeah. dress? How does that affect you when you look at that? Which oh, what is on your mind when you see that? I think it's contemptible. I mean, I, I, you know, the first uh, 2015 when I was elected, I went to the first one just out of curiosity to to see, and you know, there, there, we we had to walk down that uh, aisle to the the House of Lords, and you get you get squeezed in, huddled in at the back of of a little space that their lordships have agreed that the uh, the commoners can stand in, and you know, and and watching. Uh, this woman with a you know a hundred thousand pound hat in her head talk about poverty. It was uh, weird, really weird. But I, and and since then I've had nothing to do with it. To be honest, I think all of this theatre is just uh, ridiculous. I mean, uh, and I, you know, but I, they love it. You know, I mean, the the establishment and all of them around it. They they love getting dressed in their their finery and their hats and their guns and playing this game. But it's. Uh, it's something that really ought to be left behind in a in a fairy tale version of history. It's got no, it ought to have no part of a, a modern democratic process where people are in control of their own lives. It's uh, so it, it you know I, I I find it contemptible and I just try like a lot of stuff down here I try, I try and not let it get to me, John, and uh, just keep away from it. You have to actually give an oath. In which yeah, yeah. I know. You, you, you you would effectively be beholden to the the monarch and her yeah. successors, and that is the I mean, and that's the thing that sticks in the throat most. I mean, it's you know, you're not just pledging an oath, but to to their heirs and successors. So you're actually pledging an oath to people not yet born. I mean, it's it, it's astonishingly bad. I mean, we we preface that uh, the, the statement we had to say by by saying you know our accountability is to the people who elected us, but. Um, you know, but even then, you know, at the end of the day, you have to bite the bullet and do it. Otherwise, you don't get the chance to represent the people who elected you. But it is one of many aspects of the the British democratic system that is well, it is isn't democratic, and it, um, uh, and it actually is uh, is, is uh, the negation of, of democracy. And one day, maybe the people of Britain will have the good sense to get rid of that. I don't know, but uh, in the meantime. Uh, I'm fed up waiting, and uh, <laughs> I, I, and and I. Uh, that's why I want Scotland to become a an independent country and do things differently with a, a more transparent, democratic, inclusive political process that that's grounded on, you know, people respecting each other's views and having the right to determine uh, how you know collectively how how things are run. So, in terms of respecting other people's views. Uh, one of the things that struck a lot of people very forcibly uh, was when Ian Blackford got up to speak with me. Droves of scores of uh, members got up and left the chamber. Now, they did everything except walk in front of them, uh, but they made a commotion. Uh, I think maybe the speaker had to intervene. Uh, people regard that as hugely disrespectful yeah, yeah. and abhorrent. Well, when people look at that, you can understand why they might say, well, these people just don't care. This, this is a step beyond not caring, though. It's actually to say, look, I want to show you my disrespect for your views. But there doesn't seem to be much respect there. I agree. I mean, maybe not all of them. I mean, some of them were just getting up, were leaving because they had to leave, right? But, but there are certainly... <coughs> some of the Tories who do it quite deliberately and provocatively and, you know, contemptuously, really, and it's extremely disrespectful. But, I mean, that's, you know, these, these are people who put up with us as a sort of you know, irritation and inconvenience because they have to. Uh, they, they, they don't really want to engage with us or appreciate our view or, or you know, try and meet us uh, in, in, a, in an argument. They, they, they want us to have us little uh exposure uh, as 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 possible and it it is it is shocking the way they do that but uh you know the fact that they do it means just another argument i think for for setting up a new political process in scotland and doing things ourselves without having to, to put up with that is there anyone on the benches that you feel doesn't share these views and does understand even to a limited degree uh, what you're trying to achieve. Is there any empathy 
in it amongst any of them that do do what um, you're about. There's a, very few. I mean, there are there are a few Tories who um, have. I mean, they wouldn't they wouldn't agree with us, but they at least respect our. You know, the, the the fact that we have a different point of view, and they do. There are a few, very few, but there are some who actually do subscribe to the view that whilst they might disagree with it, if that's what people in Scotland want, then that has to be respected. Uh, but um, I think the vast majority now of the Conservative Party don't actually have a, an understanding or a, a recognition that Scotland is a separate political entity and that, and, and that therefore the claim of right for Scotland is, is a valid concept. They don't understand that. They just think that it's, you know, 8.4% of the British population and, 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 and as a minority that, you know, has the right to be represented, but they don't have the right to actually do anything that they want to do because the, the, the bigger majority in Britain don't want it. And that's that's their view. They regard themselves as being in a single unitary British state without any... It's almost as... I mean, and, of course, that view mitigates against even devolution. I mean, they don't... Uh, but And, and as, I, as I said at the beginning, a generation ago, whereas there were Tories who believed in devolution and understood the concept uh, and were seeking that sort of constitutional development, nowadays... That thinking is almost absent from the Tory benches. They, they, you know, they don't. They literally don't understand it. It seems to some people that also applies to the Labour Party. I mean, for example, um, somebody mentioned to me um, or sent me a clip rather of uh, Lisa Nandy speaking about Northern Ireland, in which she said, "Well, you know, we, we're just not going to accept the, the democratic wish because we believe in the United Kingdom." I was taken aback by that until I realised that she was also the person who said. I think a couple of years ago, look, if there's a problem with independence, we should do what the Catalonians had done to them. And that doesn't strike me as any sort of sympathy for, you know, a rearrangement, a constitutional change. Yeah, no, I mean, I didn't hear that particular comment by, by Lisa Nandy, but, you know, there are plenty in the Labour benches who, who take this view as well, and they just they don't really have any understanding of what our argument is about for, for constitutional change because they, they, they think Glasgow and Edinburgh are just the same as Liverpool and, and, and Leeds, the problems are the same. I mean, they, they share a lot of similar problems, but they are, you know, they are also completely different and they also have you know, different political rights and aspirations and there's no understanding of that, which is you know, one of the reasons, I think, why the Labour Party in Scotland still is is very much a minority political force compared to what it, it used to be. You know, the understanding of Scottish differences, of Scottish uh, uniqueness, was much more prevalent in the Labour Party 30 years ago than it, than it is today. And, of course, this then becomes a sort of almost self-fulfilling prophecy because if, if all of the people in the Labour Party who respected that leave it and go and join the SNP, which is what a lot, a lot, a lot have done, by definition, the ones that are left are even more blinkered and narrow-minded in their in their thinking, and even less likely to appreciate uh, the, the the necessity for Scottish autonomy. It is interesting. I mean, when when you look at the situation, I mean, it's interesting too. For us, we've had lots of centre right uh, uh, advisors and representatives on the program. The question I put to them most commonly is, why isn't there a right wing independence party in Scotland? Because if you look at historically, if you look at independence parties across the across the world, there's usually a right wing entity somewhere hmm. along the uh, blood and soil and all that nonsense. Uh, it, that doesn't exist in Scotland. And their answer is, well, it's it's because the SNP is such a broad church that it accommodates all points of view. Now, you know, you, you have to be terribly myopic to come to that mm -hmm. position. It seems to me because you've only got to look at the SNP policies to see the fairly firmly left or centre. Partly conditioned, I suspect, because that there's a block grant system in place, and you know decisions about earning don't 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 feature too much. Uh, but that's their position by and large: is that the SNP leaves no space for any right wing views because they're accommodated somehow. I'm not quite sure how that happens, but uh, <laughs> what would your reaction be to that statement that the SNP is such a broad church so there's no space for a right wing party independent? Well, it is. A broadish church, but I mean, as you say, the centre of gravity is certainly to the left of centre, and uh, I mean, it, it is 
principally a social democratic party in terms of its social and economic program. So, uh, uh, I, I don't, but I don't think that's the reason why there isn't a, a right wing sort of strand to the independence movement. I, I think it's more that the desire for political change in Scottish independence has now become so integrated with the desire for social and economic change as well that I guess the right wing now see opposition to independence as a way of defending the establishment, defending the status quo, defending existing power and wealth relationships in Britain. So they are worried, I think, about the fact that Scottish independence might, as well as leading to an independent Scotland, might also destabilise a lot of the existing power relationships inside England and Wales as well. So that's that's why they're against it. It's because, you know, <clears throat> in in the modern era, the two things have become the, the, the programme for uh, social and economic change and for constitutional change have very much become two sides of the of the same coin. Yeah. Um, and, and that's not the case in a lot of other, you know, parts of the world where there are independence movements. They're not so fundamentally linked to the idea of social and economic change. I mean, it's interesting. Also, when I ask them, there will ever be a Scottish Conservative Party prior to independence? Their answer, by and large, is uh, n- no, bec- uh, because we sort of believe in more devolution. And that, to, my, to which I question, that my question is, how does that work? And generally, they fall back on feder- federalism. I.e., we could create a state like Canada. Um, and when I point out that that works because the components of Canada can be d- construed as being roughly the same. When you've got one big partner, <laughs> it's difficult to see how federation could work. And that, besides, it requires somebody to go to the big partner and say, you need to change all of your systems. <laughs> to accommodate this little part, if you say oh, it's only 8%. I mean, why should they? I mean, if I was sitting in, in Crowthorne and walking around Berkshire and somebody came to me and said, we're going to have to recast the whole thing because of these people, that obviously would get lost, you know, why should mm. I? You know, give me a more compelling reason. I can see why you need to change, but I don't think that's a terribly good, good argument for change. How much would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I don't think federalism works as a concept in 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 a in a place like britain where there is such an asymmetry between scotland and england uh Mm -hmm. it it might have worked a a few hundred years ago when you know when actually the population difference wasn't nearly as great as it was in 1801 uh the scotland was 20 percent of the british population now now it's 8.4 so there might have been an argument in 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 the past but i mean that that boat has sailed i think to be honest, if I was to uh, if I was to have, be in a room talking to these people, I would try and get them to a position where they uh, where, where they consider a confederal relationship between independent nations of, of Britain. Uh, but to do that, you need to have uh, you know you need to have an independent Scotland and indeed an independent Wales and Ireland as well, so that people can determine the nature of that participation, the nature of that relationship rather than it being imposed from Westminster. But, I, you know, down the line, I mean, probably after, well after I'm gone, but I, I would very much welcome the idea of independent nations of Britain working together voluntarily uh, on a confederal basis, because there's an awful lot of things that are probably better done on an island basis. But, yeah. the, that, that, you know, that needs to be built from the bottom up by independent political units. You know, that notion, of course, is a pretty old one. I mean, that's... Uh, you know, Thomas Muir and, and Wolf Tone were talking about that hundreds of years ago. Would Scandinavia be a good model for what you've just described? Well, again, that's uh, each each situation is different, I think. But uh, and it depends on what you mean by Scandinavia. You know, well, uh, you, for uh, example, Norway is a sovereign state, so is Denmark, so is Sweden. Just yeah, yeah. Restricting ourselves to those three. The airline is called Scandinavian Airways, a Scandinavian Airline. So it's SAS. Right. It's, it's not yeah, Norwegian. Yeah. I mean, there is a Norwegian Air, but people seem to be happy with working together and cooperating on some issues, but but not on others. Scandinavia is a, maybe an example of where countries which are aligned with each other uh, and and share a lot of common history and have uh, common roots to their language and all the rest of it and culture, uh, where there's merit in them working together. But but. 
even that's a different situation from Britain, of course, because we all share the one island, um, mm. which which is which, which presents a lot of challenges, but also opportunities for governance as well. Returning to what some of your earlier remarks about applying more pressure to bring about constitutional change, uh, some people have suggested a couple of things that might that might operate in that direction. I'd like to know how you feel about it. One is the next next um, next um, general election it ought to be a plebiscite, i.e. that MPs stand quite firmly on the fact that if you vote for us, uh, it will definitely be regarded as uh, specifically and categorically for a referendum. No question, no debate. That, that's it. So I have difficulty with that, John, because of the, the, the electoral system. I mean, I think I think there's no shortcut to getting a situation where a simple majority of people uh, in in a in a in a ballot of some kind uh, vote for Scottish independence. Now, I mean, theoretically, it, you could do that at an election, provided you counted up the votes and you had a majority of the votes cast in that. But that's not the same as electing a majority of people on first past the post, where it's perfectly possible, as the SNP has, has demonstrated, to get, you know, on occasion, 95% of the seats with less than 50% of the vote. So that, you know, so I don't think the first past the post electoral system allows its, uh, you know, presents itself as an opportunity to have that 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 vote and, and, and that political expression. But also, I think there's a problem in that having, having had the referendum in 2014, and having everyone having agreed that that was a proper and legitimate way to to ask this question and 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 to make the decision, to then go back in that that doesn't sit well with me. It, it looks as if because we you know we can't do it one way, we're 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 trying to do it a different way. I'm quite happy to to ha- in in terms of asking the question, engaging what people think in Scotland. I think a referendum along the lines of the 2014 one is is the way. To go, the the big difference, of course, is that in 2014 the British government gave a a, a, a statement in advance that they would re- respect and work to implement the outcome of of that referendum. Then that's what they're refusing to do this time. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't have the referendum and ask people what they want. And of course, if we get a positive res- result in that, that in itself then changes the dynamic with Westminster and and their ability to resist it further. Can I be clear about what you mean by that? Are you suggesting that the Scottish uh, Parliament would call for a referendum because of the strength of opinion? Since the 2014 referendum, I mean, initially, in the couple of years after that, you know, people were licking their wounds or regrouping or trying to make the best of a bad situation. But it then became clear, well, two things became clear. One, the proposition that was offered in 2014 uh, had changed almost beyond recognition with, you know, Boris and Brexit and, and everything else that the the thing people had voted for had itself changed. Mm-hmm. But also public, uh, the desire to have to make the decision had not gone away. If anything, it, it was as strong uh, several years after 2014 as it was before it. So it didn't actually settle anything. Now, up until last year, let's be generous and say opinion was divided about whether or not there should be a further referendum on the question of Scottish independence. And that is why last May, in the general election to the Scottish Parliament, my party put front and centre in its manifesto that if you vote for us, and if we have, you know, if we uh, run the Scottish government, we will have another referendum. That, you know, no ifs or buts, that, that is what okay. you are voting oh, for. Not- and people elected... A Scottish Parliament on that basis. Yeah. So it's not. So they, they are, that argument's done now. There has to be a referendum. Do you think the Scottish Parliament, because of that commitment, uh, can can hold its own referendum and then present those results as part of a, a pressure on the UK government to agree? Well, it would be preferable, of course, if there could be something like the Edinburgh Agreement again, and if we could get the British uh, cabinet into a room to, to, to talk about it. That would be preferable. That is, I'm sure, what the Scottish government is going to try and do. But if if they still refuse to do that, then I do believe the Scottish government, uh, the Scottish parliament, has every right to consult the people of Scotland on this question because it was elected 
pledging to do so. Uh, so that is why they, 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 they should go ahead and do it. Yes, of course, in my view. Now, I dare say there, there will be arguments about that and we will have to be very careful and meticulous about framing the legislation that allows that to happen in a way that is at least uh, defensible to any legal challenge and, and any sabotage from from Westminster. But, uh, you know, there are smarter people than me working on the drafting of that legislation. I, I'm, I'm sure they will be able to frame something which allows a referendum to take place and, and which is within the legitimate competence of the of the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government. So I would guess, I, I hope not, but I would guess that there's going to be a, it's not going to be smooth sailing uh, and that once the legislation is published and, the, and, 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 and an act of the Scottish Parliament is uh, is enacted that there will be challenges to that so you know we will we, we'll see how it we'll see how it pans out i don't know to how confident the british state will feel about trying to uh you know overturn the democratic wishes expressed in an election by 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 using the courts i don't think it's a very good look uh but we'll we'll see but the, i mean the point is we we sort of have to take this one step at a time uh and and the next move is to is for the scottish parliament to agree uh, how a referendum will take place and to and to make provision for that. And I'm confident that's going to happen within months. Well, that would be... I think, I think the, uh, the, the the whole body politic in Scotland would be galvanised by that. I, I, I agree with that as well, John, because I think, I mean, obviously, you know, we're being candid. There has been a lot of uh, drift and division and disillusion within, within uh, our movement. And, you know, but I... I do believe the spirit of 2014 can be can be rekindled and refocused. It'll be it'll be a slightly different character and have a slightly different focus than it did then. But you know the, that energy and enthusiasm and vibrancy that we had, I am confident that we can can rebuild that and get that back. And key to doing that, I think, will be to have a date to aim for. Uh, and have an event to aim for because that will focus our, our collective minds in a way that it's not been possible to do in recent years. I think a lot of people uh, watching and listening will be heartened by that. The thing that would probably give them pause for thought, though, is the role that the BBC played in the last uh, referendum, which I think concerned lots of people, uh, both inside the independence movement and, and outside. I mean, one right-wing journalist said the BBC was biased against independence, and that's its job. A lot of people would probably agree with that. <laughs> that's what it looked to them. Uh, wouldn't that be a huge challenge going into a referendum? With, uh, the, the BBC seems to become even more centralised since, uh, since 2014. Well, I, of course it would be a challenge. I mean, and it's exactly the sort of thing we would need to monitor extremely carefully and uh, and and challenge uh, i mean I, I you know i don't think it would be acceptable and if i mean could the bbc because it's a, a public body and it, you know is governed by statute there are opportunities to do that there's but there's, there's a wider question of course of the the media more generally which by and large is 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 quite hostile to the idea of independence so i think we're going to have to uh, do a lot of work to to prepare that on that front as well uh, yeah. But you know, these are all challenges we have to grasp and get, get, get you know, get our sleeves rolled up and get get in about it. It's um, yeah. uh, although I would say that I mean, of course, at the end of the day, you know, they, like, I, I, I think it's fair to say most of the Scottish media were sort of campaigning against the SNP Scottish government in in the run up to the last election and in the in the local elections last week. It, it doesn't stop us winning, you know. So because people. Yeah, people aren't going to be conned by the media. They have other ways of getting information now. And uh, as, so, as well as keeping very close tabs on the media and challenging them and rebutting them, what they say, every step of the way, we need to actually ramp up our own means of internal communication as well and how we talk to each other and share facts and information. I think that's key. I think that's key. Uh, one of the things we're very keen on here on the Nation Talks is uh, a constitution for Scotland. What's your take on that? What's your feeling about a written codified constitution for Scotland? Well, I, I, I mean, I, of course, I mean, that, that's, that there ought to be one. But I mean, I guess my, I, I, I think what we need to do, I mean, and I know that Mike Russell and others have been working this idea of an interim 
constitution. You, you, I mean, we, we need we need a constitutional framework that takes us from uh, the the decision to become an independent country to the execution of that decision and actually establishing uh, a, an independent country. And I and I I think that we we don't need a. I mean, I think it's. There's no no requirement or need to draw up a constitution in advance and then say we're having a a, a, a referendum and if you vote yes you'll be agreeing to this constitution. I don't, I, I, don't, I think that's the wrong way to do it. I think you have a a vote in a referendum on the principle of becoming an independent country, and then part of the process of becoming independent is a big national conversation on what type of constitution you want the country to have. Uh, and I, I think there's a lot of mechanisms for in, engaging civic society, for using citizens' assemblies and other forms of consultation and debate to energize people around these constitutional ideals. I mean, sure, I think we can have a, I mean, we in, in, the, in the referendum campaign, we can talk of this and we will be a, a, a series, I think, of constitutional objectives and aspirations that we can set out in terms of, uh, well, in terms of all of the human rights dimensions that a constitution should uh, encompass, for example. Uh, but the actual document itself, I see that as being some years down the line after a, a big process of, uh, of, 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 of debate and consultation. And actually, perhaps a, a further you know, plebiscite of some kind to actually enshrine that constitution in law once, once, once that point is reached. So you would like to see an interim constitution of some kind? Oh, I, think, I think there has to be some sort of uh, document, whether you call it a constitution, but I mean, it, it, would, it, it, it would say uh, how things run in the, in, in the meantime, and it would probably also provide the mechanism for having the final constitution or for moving towards the final constitution. That sounds, that sounds great. I want to thank you very much indeed, Tommy, uh, for sharing with us. Is, are there any last remarks or points that you would like to make that perhaps we haven't covered up until now? We didn't get into the debate about what we're doing down here, uh, you know, and, and, and why, you know, what's the SNP doing in Westminster? So, uh, well, and I know, I know, well, yeah, but I mean, it's, I, I, every time I speak at meetings and stuff, I think people are always uh, very interested and sometimes concerned that, you know, that we, we spend too much time here or that, uh, that our focus is not, not in Scotland. I mean, I just to reassure your, your uh, viewers and listeners that, in, in, you know, from all of the conversations I have with my colleagues, our focus is very much in, in Scotland. Uh, we, uh, you know, I, I mean, I am down here maybe two days a week while Parliament is sitting. The rest of the time I'm in the constituency and, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm campaigning in Scotland, and that's how the, the rest of us actually see it as well. But having said that, there is an important job of work to do here in terms of preparing uh, British public opinion for what's about to happen in Scotland and making sure that people understand it. Not only is that, you know, a democratic, democratic and, and progressive uh, process that, that's happening, uh, it, but it's something they have no need to be afraid of. In fact, they should even embrace it. So we we also see ourselves as ambassadors for the for 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 the cause of, of Scottish independence here and trying to stop the demonisation of it and stop and, and to demystify it and make it make it explain to people that it it is really what it is just a normal part of democratic processes that that happens in every part of the world where people run the place in which they live. So uh, that's what we are sort of trying to do here. And of course, using the House of Commons whenever we can, as, as, you, as you showed Ian doing yesterday, um, mm -hmm. as a platform to, to prosecute that ambition. Yeah. Well, that's excellent. Thanks very much, Tommy. I'm very, very grateful for you joining us. And thanks to everyone who submitted questions ahead of time. So I just want to uh, leave you with uh, some thoughts on the... Uh, what uh, people in social media think about the Queen's speech yesterday. And I looked at a lot of them, and I, I wanted to share this one with you and also with you, Tommy. Somebody said, today, a priceless gold hat with a 370 carat diamond and 400 other jewels was driven in a custom-made Rolls Royce to a £2.5 billion pound palace where it was placed next to a gold chair on which sat one of the world's richest men in a room crammed with unelected legislators. Uh, the uh, richest man then told 
two million cold and hungry subjects that there was no money to help them. <laughs> yeah, that about sums it up. That just about sums it up. Thanks for listening, everybody. And join us again next Friday when our podcast will be this month's Mibby's Eye Show. It's all about pensions in an independent Scotland. And anyone who remembers 2014 knows that was a critical point that people wanted to know more about. So we have Tim Ride out to explain how it's all going to work. If you haven't yet subscribed to the Scottish Independence podcast, please do so. We have shows every Friday and often extras midweek as well. You can listen wherever you get your podcasts.